go. All right, welcome. I'm so excited to be here. This is our final, final snapshot webinar in this five series, five webinar series. So let me share my screen and we're gonna get rolling along here together for this journey. And this is a fun one. I love learning about universal design principles, super fun. So here we go. Let me just get my notes up. And honored to be here. So say hello in the chat while I just get us going here. Um, if you're new, say I'm new. If you're returning, let me know you're returning. And let's just feel some community together. And thank you for being um, kind about what just happened to my internet. I appreciate all of you. So here we go. My name is Rebecca Corelli. You are here for Universal Design for Learning and Science. And so we're really going to dive into this question here. So I'm going to read the question out loud for our focus today, and I'm just going to ask you to quickly read over our goals. So we're here to consider how do we enact and modify curriculum to reduce barriers and leverage student resources. So come on in. I'll give you about 30 seconds to read through the goals, and then I'll just gently push us forward in our learning today. Okay, so we've got a tall order for our 55 minutes together that I planned, but I strategically created this to kind of chunk and chew it little by little. So just follow my lead and make sure you've got this resource. Does everybody have the resource I built you for today, which is our final webinar in this series? Thumbs up, give me a ready in the chat, something that says you've got it, you're here, you're good to go. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Love the feedback. Okay, so let's take a look at this. Since this is our last one, I removed the link to sign up for more. But what I did put here, because a lot of you have emailed me about how do I find the recordings? Well, they're all on YouTube now. So if you click this link, it will take you to the Activate's um, YouTube channel. And you can subscribe and then you'll see them. They're kind of sprinkled in here, but just go to videos and you'll see these are called the snapshot webinars. So I figured since this is our last one, let's talk about how you can find all of these and that'll be your easiest way to get there. As always, I give you a PDF of the slides. So if you uh, want to look at the slides again, you have access to them. And then here's the resources we're going to use for our time together today. So during our session, I, I'll say, okay, let's open number two, let's open number three, et cetera. So this is just a one-stop shop of everything you need. So hopefully you've got it and you're ready to go. So first, what we're going to do, we always start off with a little bit of reflecting. And if you just joined us, I'll put the link to the resource collection back in here. And this is about reflecting on the diversity that's in your classroom. So first and foremost, I wanna talk about, you know, all of our classrooms are diverse. And this can include many, many different aspects of diversity. And so let's go through this a little bit. Every classroom is diverse. And this means it includes learners that may have a disability or students who are emergent multilinguals or learners who come from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. Uh, furthermore, it really is diversity in students' interests, diversity in their skills and preferences. And we know that our students really belong to multiple groups of diversity. So there's groups of students, including you know, Black, Latinx, Indigenous, emergent multilinguals, and students with cognitive disabilities. But all these kids may have uh, been and continue to be in underserved in science classrooms. So we're really going to focus on some diversity today and how using the UDL principles really helps us break down those barriers. And so these students really require some intentional support. And even if you don't have some of these groups in your class, you definitely have some sort of diversity within your student um, class in your classroom. So here we go. Now that I've kind of just touched upon the different, you know, um, different ways students may be diverse in your classroom, I want you to go into what we call the alone zone. And if you're new, um, this is a metacognitive strategy that gives you time to think by yourself without the influence of anybody else. So I'm going to ask you 
to think on your own, but be prepared to share your ideas in the chat. I'm gonna for two minutes have you going alone. And what I want you to think of is just think about your students and what kind of diversity exists in your classroom. And what are the diverse strengths and or resources your learners bring to your classroom? And what are the diverse challenges your learners experience when learning science? So I'm gonna ask you to think, if you wanna jot down some ideas, that's great. But when we share, just share whatever you're comfortable sharing. It can be anything from one of these three questions. So I'll be quiet. We'll go in a lone zone time for two minutes to reflect. Just think about one or all of these questions and be prepared to share in the chat in just a little bit. about 40 seconds left. So let's come back together and we're just going to do our um, waterfall protocol. So if you're new, this just means I'm going to give you 30 seconds to think about which of these questions you'd like to respond to. I'm going to hit the timer for 30 seconds. That'll give you 30 seconds to type away in the chat. And then once the timer goes off, we will all hit enter at the same time. So try not to hit enter until the 30 seconds is up, which I know can be tricky. So 30 seconds is gonna go. You're gonna type whatever you wanna share. That way we can just collaborate. And then once the timer goes off, hit enter and all the responses will waterfall down. So here we go, 30 seconds, find the chat and come on in. Okay, time is up. Go ahead and hit enter. And then let's just go through and just take a moment and read everyone's ideas. Different personalities and perspectives. Ah, diversity in how they see themselves as learners. They struggle with academic language, vocabulary. Sure, there's a lot of great ideas in here. So thank you so, so much. Various reading levels, diverse learners and diverse levels of tolerance, lack of vocabulary. Small country town, we have students that have traveled. Ah, students that have never left. Okay, so we have like a wide, wide range of diversity and challenges that exist. So that's great that we had a moment to just kind of take a temperature check on what we were thinking. And so now that we've had time to reflect, I'm just gonna gently push us forward to talk about what UDL actually is. So here we go. So what is universal design for learning? And so what it really is, 
It's a framework um, that was developed by the Center for Applied Special Technology, which is called CAST. So it really was created to improve and optimize teaching and learning for all learners based on scientific insights into how humans actually learn. And so UDL involves anticipating the needs and the strengths of a variety of learners and building those into instructional design from the outset. It is a process by which a curriculum, so that means like goals, methods, materials, assessments, are intentionally and systematically designed from the beginning to set out and address these differences of individuals. So it also, when you think about curricula that um, are designed with the UDL principles in mind, the whole goal is to work to minimize barriers and maximize learning for all students that walk through our doors. So I did give you in number two, if you've never been on the CAST website, I did provide that for you. It's right here. If you're curious, I gave you the website and I also gave you a PDF of the guidelines, which we're going to take a look at next. So it's up to you if you want to look over them, but I am going to call out some major principles here. So now that we know its intention was really about, you know, minimizing those barriers. Well, what what does UDL actually include? Well, there's three main UDL principles. And so they, these principles offer a set of concrete suggestions that may be applied to any discipline or domain to ensure that all learners can access and participate in meaningful, challenging learning opportunities. So here's the three principles and what they focus on. First is engagement, then we have representation, and then action and expression. So let's look at engagement. And if you're looking here, this is the green column here. This provides multiple ways to engage and or motivate students to learn. It also considers how to tap into the learner's interest um, and offer appropriate challenges and increase motivation. So this is about engaging students, right? Looking at interest, sustaining effort, and that self-regulation piece. Now let's move over to this purple column, and this is about representation. So this is about the what of learning. If this is the why, this is the what. So here we go. Representation really provides multiple ways or access points to present information to students. And this is stuff we do all the time as teachers, right? We think of multiple ways of representation, multiple modalities, things like that. And then the how of learning. So let's look at the blue column now. This is the um, action and expression, which is about providing multiple means and options for students to show and express what they know, right? This is that student choice, that uh, progress monitoring, the I'm going to draw a model, I'm going to use diverse sense making. So all those you know, different ways of showing what we know fall in this blue category. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at an open SIED example from an actual curriculum to see how it matched the UDL principles we just talked about. So since this is just a snapshot, we're only going to get to do a snapshot of a lesson. So again, remember, Activate has much longer professional learning, but here we're just here for a short hour together. So we're just going to dip our toes in very quickly and look at an example from open SIED. So here we go. So we're going to look at three different examples and we're going to look for like how are these principles illustrated and acted upon within those materials. So let's look at this first one for the green com column of the why. The lesson, so when OpenSayed creates um, the units, instead of starting a unit by naming a topic, like this unit is called thermal energy we begin by engaging students with the phenomena and elicit student questions. So that means we put them in the position of the scientists, we engage them in something observable in the world around them, and it starts to make them curious, motivated, and wonder. So that's a little bit different than just by starting off with, this is the thermal energy unit. As for representation, so if we look at this purple section here, Instead of the teacher being that sage on the stage, direct instruction and providing a lecture all day long, the students are going to manipulate and simulation and explore particles. So this is that, you know, explore before explain sort of model. And then finally, for the blue section on the how of learning, when we talk about action and expression, what we're going to look at 
is instead of requiring all students to just write an explanation in text, students are allowed and encouraged to represent their ideas in words and images using models. So let's dive into this. To further help you understand how OpenSciA developed these curricular materials that we're gonna look at, they've adopted something called a social mo model for disability. And if you've never heard this before, or you're kind of curious to learn more, I did give this to you, it's number nine. So if you come down here, I gave you these additional resources that were used to create this webinar. So number nine is down here. And if you wanna go learn some more about it, I gave you the link so you can do that. But here's the gist. OpenSciEd adopts this social model for disability. And in this view, what this means is, disabilities do not inherently reside in the individual. Learners are disabled not by their impairment or differences, but rather by barriers they face in the learning environment. So again, this is all about reducing those barriers that we're gonna talk about today. So some of those barriers can be physical, like ramps to a building or caused by people, such as people assuming the learner cannot do a particular task. And sometimes in teaching, we call that deficit thinking, where we say things like, oh, our kids can't do that. Instead of thinking in an asset mindset of what amazing resources do our kids bring with them already. So disability is not always obvious. We may need to find out what barriers students are facing. And then finally, this model also helps us recognize and minimize barriers and can influence how we both design curriculum, but also how we enact curriculum. So these are kind of like four touch points from this social model for disability that OpenSci had used to develop these with the intention and goal of the following, removing these barriers and creating more equitable learning opportunities. So let's keep going. So here's some simple UDL steps. Number one, determine the goal of the lesson in the unit. So if we're gonna sit down and create some curricular materials that reduce these barriers, step one, Determine the goal of the lesson in the unit. What do I want the students to know, do, and care about? Number two, identify those barriers that might interfere with the students reaching those goals. And then step three, to eliminate the barriers, use the UDL principles, which we're gonna dive deeply into very soon, to create flexible paths to learning. So now that we've kind of grounded ourselves in this social model for disabilities and thinking about these three different UDL principles, let's go take a look at a lesson and put it all together. So I'm just gonna set the stage and I promise I will stop talking soon and you're gonna get to work, but I've got to set you up for success. So here we go. We're gonna look at um, lesson one from this uh, Open Syed, how and why does the earth's surface change? Okay, so we're looking at lesson one from this unit, and this is called What Causes Mount Everest to Move in Different Ways? So this is like a plate tectonics unit, but instead of just saying this is the plate tectonics unit, we're going to engage the kids with something they actually care about and something that's really curious and motivating that you're going to see in just a second. So we got lesson one here. Then what we're going to use is called the Universal Design for Learning Principles Observations. We're gonna be using this to write down observations in just a second as I walk you through parts of the lesson. So here we go. Uh, first and foremost, when the students began this experience, here's how they explored the phenomena. So what they had is it launches with two student videos. So clip one over here, an amazing clip of an eyewitness account showing climbers on, on Mount Everest actually experiencing an earthquake. And then clip two of a TV news segment. And so what they discovered is during this news segment, descri it describes how the regular movement of Mount Everest was interrupted and temporarily reversed by the earthquake. So basically Mount Everest moves northeast, but the earthquake reversed the movement. So this is an amazing phenomenon. And so what happens next, and let's get you, let's go get this document actually. So as I talk, you can make some observations. Here we go. Go to number three right here, and it is a forced copy. Let's make a copy. That way each of you has your own. 
and you can write your own notes. So let's make sure, make sure you're ready. Type in the chat if you're ready or you're good to go. You've got everything you need. So we're in number three. And as I walk you through the parts and pieces of how we engage students, thank you, Loretta. I appreciate your feedback. You're just gonna type right here. Here's where you're going to take your notes, right over here. So I'll give you like a minute to just kind of read through this, just so as I walk you through these parts, you can start to take some notes. And we're only going on this first page. This second page is gonna be for something later. So I'll be quiet and just kind of get used to this document here for like, I don't know, about a minute. All right, so now that you've kind of read through it, let's keep going in this lesson. So it began with this phenomenon and the kids exploring the phenomenon and how this earthquake moved in the opposite direction. And then where it goes next is they keep exploring the phenomenon and they read this reading with a partner that further explains to them that Mount Everest is constantly moving northeast and growing taller. And that during the earthquake, the mountain moved back southwest, but it didn't change its height. And so what the students had to do then is read with a partner and stop at the end of each paragraph to add noticings and wonderings to their science notebooks. So it's kind of like a, a little strategy. Read a paragraph, notice wonder. Paragraph, notice wonder. Paragraph, repeat. So think about what we've seen so far with this lesson and how it fits with UDL. So this is just the beginning. And so what UDL principles are evident? And I'm gonna give you some time to think about this. So what the students um, had done is they were introduced to this surprising phenomenon. They had two videos and a reading and were asked to record notice and wonders. So just by looking at this beginning anchoring phenomenon, what UDL principles are evident? So I'll give you two minutes to jot down any notes here. And then we're gonna watch a video coming up here soon. So two minutes to write in some observations and think of what they did with the phenomenon. Okay, about 40 seconds left. Think about what principles are evident as students engage with a surprising phenomena.
All right, let's close up our thoughts. All right, hopefully you found some examples so far in the anchoring phenomenon routine. And so I'm just gonna review a couple that I had found. And so let's talk about the engagement. So, so far in this anchoring phenomena routine with this Mount Everest, like puzzling phenomena, it was complex, novel, and an authentic, right? It's something all learners can engage in together. And so there's familiar routines like the notice and wonder, which can minimize the threats and distractions. Notice and wonder is something we should be using all the time. And the kids are used to it. For representation, um, one thing to note is that students can access the phenomena through multiple media, right? Two videos plus a text. And then pausing the video each time to record notice and wonders or, um, or asking them to pause through the reading also, not only the videos, but also through the reading. Every paragraph, stop, notice, wonder. Read another, stop, notice, wonder. Helps chunk and chew, right? It helps them guide the information processing. And then the notice and wonder chart for action and expression is a scaffold that helps students in expressing their ideas, making thinking visible through committing to it on paper. So what we're gonna do next is we're gonna watch a video coming up here soon of a teacher actually enacting this lesson. Um, similar to previous workshops, when we've um, watched videos, I'm gonna just go over the guidelines we usually use when watching videos of teaching. First and foremost, these are actual real classrooms, which means there's also a lot of students who did not give permission or consent. So some ground rules. Remember, our classrooms are very complex. There's much we don't know about the students and the teacher and their history together. Presume positive intentions and expertise on part of the teacher. Next, assume what the kids are saying makes sense to them. Focus on how what the teacher and students are doing is serving the learning goals of the lesson and providing access for diverse learners. So those are our ground rules and we're gonna come in to watch this video here. And what I want you to do this time is if you scroll down to the second table in this same document. So if you scroll down, there's another um, sheet right here, another table for you to continue taking observations. And so as we go, if you, you know, if you want to keep going up here, that's okay. But if you run out of space, there's more down here. So I just wanted you to know there's two on this page. And here's how the video is going to work. So you're going to be in the alone zone, which means we're all going to be thinking by ourselves. This video is about eight to nine minutes. And the reason it's so long is because it has five quick clips. And after each chunk, it's going to give you 30 seconds. It'll say like, record your thoughts. So 30 seconds to write your observations. And again, we are looking for the UDL principles in this video. Now, if you are somebody who would like the transcript, I did give you the transcript right here in number four. It's up to you if you want to use it. I just wanted you to know it's there. And the video is also here, but I'm going to play it for all of us. So here we go. As you watch, jot down some observations. When are you seeing these UDL principles in action? So here we go. Let's start with the video. Can you talk to me about what you guys actually saw? Like, what stood out from the video to you? And I'd love to hear from somebody we haven't yet heard from today. Uh, Chanel, go ahead. What did you catch from the video clip? For the news one with the weather guy, um, I said that Everest has been moving northeast at four centimeters, like a year. Did anybody else catch that? Yeah, me too. Okay, cool. Can someone just explain quickly northeast for me? Like, what does that actually mean is going on? No, and I'm not talking to you. <laughs> Ethan gave me a little demonstration. Mallory, what do you mean? So if north is here and east is here, it's kind of moving in the diagonal through north and east. Can somebody say it a different way? Okay. No, no, no. Yeah, like we're, we're getting there. <laughs> Sophie, what does it mean? Like in between both what? In between both what? Mm -hmm. like in between north and east. In between north and east. Okay, so if I'm a mountain, right, it's going 
north and east like this, right? Is that right? Or is it like this? It's like that? Yeah. Yes? So wait, maybe we could like turn the rug into like a coordinate plane. So if this is like a coordinate plane map, right? If that's north, right? This would be just moving this north, right? And this would be just moving east, right? Mm -hmm. So northeast would be going towards Dex. Is that right? Yes. Okay, cool. So this is magnetic slime. It actually eats oh, magnets. Oh no! So Sorry. <laughs> All right, jot down some examples. I apologize. So in your model, I want you to show how Mount Everest is actually getting taller by six to seven centimeters each year, okay? And at the same time, I also want you to think about how is it actually moving to the northeast? So not only is it growing taller, right, but it's growing taller and it's moving. So I want you to think about what is actually causing that change. That timer's up there. I want you to work under that time constraint. Does not have to be fancy. Simple ideas. How is it actually getting taller? How is it moving to the northeast? Okay, so you should have how it gets taller and then also how it moves to the northeast. Right? Two movements. Now, with that other color, okay, I want you to now, with that other color, think about how the earthquake happens. So now I want you, in that other color, to actually explain how the earthquake happens, okay? And think about how what typically happens now compares to what actually happens when this earthquake occurs. I'm hearing people say like, oh my gosh, do you have this? So there's parts of the world that have really big ones, right? Um, they can happen in the middle of the ocean. Does anyone notice anything else where a lot of these tend to happen? What does the relief map tell us about where these earthquakes are actually happening? <coughs> Besides the ocean, because Charlie pointed that out. Sebastian? Wherever, like, the brown areas on that map or where mostly where the earthquakes are? Yeah, we tend to see that there might be some sort of connection between, hey, a lot of these earthquakes are actually happening near what? Uh, uh, mountains, yeah, right? So just to kind of standpoint, I mean, I know when I like told you like something about Mount Everest, this is so intriguing to us because we, A, don't have any mountains near us, right? Chicago is like totally flat. And interestingly enough, now when we bring up the relief map, we don't have any dark brown near us here in Chicago, right? And now when I also look at the Seismic Explorer, right, the earthquake simulator, what can you also tell about Chicago? No. Nothing. No earthquakes. Okay. Um, actually, I have two ideas. Could I? Share one, please. Um, I would like to do like a simulator, but only with like the higher earthquake, so we can see if there's like any more any like areas in the world where there's like more denser earthquakes to support the reasoning. Oh, wait a minute. So. I hear you saying that Everest was a big earthquake. You want me to rerun it with only certain types of earthquakes? Yeah, like only higher up earthquakes. I don't know if I can do that. Should we try it? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna restart it. I'm gonna zoom out. And then... Hold on a second. I'm gonna zoom out all the way. I don't want this. Okay. Um, and you want me to change the magnitude? Yeah. What do you want, guys? Uh, five. Zero to five to, to six or seven? Like six or five? Six point two? Yeah. Okay. And then you want me to run it and we'll see where it goes? Yeah. Here we go.
people do, and I, this is something I want our class to work on, okay, is us actually building on each other's ideas, okay? So oftentimes, we want to just be heard, right? To be heard, and like, oh, I asked my question, good, I'm done, right? So on the board behind you, there's three sentence stems I want us to really think about as we share out our questions, okay? So as someone shares, right, they'll say a question, and then the next person is going to share. But I want them to really think about, hey, how does your question actually relate to someone else's question? So I gave you some tips, right? So you can say, my question relates to Blank's question because, or my question connects to Blank's question because, or you can even say, like, hey, someone's question actually made me wonder. So I recognize that today you may end up with a question on the board that isn't in your notebook, but it's something that kind of came up, okay? here is going to write the category heading that's on the blue post-it note. So they'll write like fault lines and tectonic plates. And then they're going to spend some time as a group actually reading through the questions in that category. And then I want you to write down here as a table, there's no wrong ideas at this point, like what kind of data might we need to help us solve that? What kind of investigation can we do? And we'll come together as a class, like how can we actually answer our questions? Okay? Sound good? Please remember, the sky is the limit. So like, don't tell me like, oh, we're limited because we're a sixth grade classroom at school. We will find a way to make it work, okay? Um, kind of like I think back to when Johnny had mentioned in our thermal energy unit, like, oh, Mrs. Frenza, there's this app on the phone that like measures light. And then I didn't have that app, but like our school science closet had those light meters. Remember when we use those? So we'll make, if there's a will, there's a way. Okay, so let's come on back. I'll give you 30 more seconds to write your observations. So just finish up your thoughts and then I'm going to gently push us forward here very soon. All right, let's close up our thoughts. And then we just watched this. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do is to go in breakout rooms for eight minutes and really just, it's gonna be actually, never mind. let's just stay whole group and we'll just share together since we're a small group here. Um, actually, no, there's kind of more than, let's see. Let me do some math real quick, 14. All right, let's do, I was going to do groups of three just so you can get some talking and you can get some ideas going. Um, let's see, we're down to 13 now. So um, we're going to do four groups. And then for the first, you know, two minutes, just introduce yourselves and then we'll go and just discuss what you saw. And I can see people possibly, let's see, we've got 12 now. So here we go. Um, or let's see, we'll make it... Where's my breakout rooms? There we go. We'll do three to four people in a room. So we'll only have three rooms and then just share. What did you see? And go through your ideas. So I will set the rooms. I'm creating them now. I think I'm going to go down since there's not very many of us. Maybe we'll go down to seven minutes. So that gives you one minute to introduce yourselves and then uh, some time to discuss. I hope that's okay. So we're going to go in for six minutes plus a 60 second warning. So come on in. It should invite you now um, and just talk about what you saw in the video and how it relates. And all the rooms are open now. Look for the button to join. And if you get stuck or you need help, please let me know.
anyone who's left behind needs some help getting in, Lori or Carrie, if you need some help, I'm happy to help you. And I will stop the recording. Where is it? Welcome back. Hopefully you had a chance to chat with some folks. Which was the idea. So thank you, thank you, thank you for going in some breakout rooms and just saying hello and chatting it up for a little bit. The rest of our folks will be back in about 20 seconds. And so we'll cut um, a little bit out of the end of this since we started a little bit late. Um, and I do apologize for my internet trouble. So here they come, here comes everybody. All right, welcome back everyone. Hopefully you said hello to some folks and got to talk about some UDL principles. And so I'm just gonna gently push us forward. And I know, um, that we started a few, you know 10 minutes late. And so we're not gonna fully do the rest of this, but let me just explain what would come next so you can understand what the rest of these resources are. So number five and number six is really when you just dive into um, what's called the checkpoints. So each of the three UDL um, principles are guidelines and um, they have checkpoints that provide these ways to reduce barriers. So if you're curious, this is one of the best documents out there. It's super amazing. Let's go look at number five. I did give you a copy and this is called the UDL full table. So it's got these nice little checkpoints and you can see that they have these numbers next to them. And so I'm just going to give you a minute to look over it. We're not going to go back in breakout rooms like I had uh, originally planned. Um, but I just wanted you to know what these are. So I'm just going to talk about it for a second. And so, oh, I love the conversation going on in the chat. Thank you. So I'll just explain this real quick. So this principles and guidelines um, and these checkpoints were created when CAST actually developed the UDL principles. So they also included these multiple checkpoints for each of the principles that goes further into detail about what might this look like? Right, so look at language and symbols, clarifying vocabulary and symbols, syntax, structure. So it just gives you a little bit more um, into that principle. So the work, like really what we're looking for is using these checkpoints because really what it can do is help clarify what is meant by the principle. So it's like a subset of principles really and how to provide concrete ways to reduce or remove those barriers that may be preventing diverse learners from accessing instruction. So that's what this document is. And what we were gonna do if we had a little bit more time is we were gonna go through what's called connecting to the principles of universal design for learning. And I know we're almost at time, so we're not going to get that far into this, but let me just show you this document real quick. And here it is, number six in this table. Again, it's going to ask you to make a copy. That way you each have your own. And this is about looking at the Everest lesson one. And so what it calls out is each of the checkpoints here and how in this lesson it was met. So as you go through, here's these checkpoints and here's how this lesson was met, right? So I'll just give you a minute to kind of peruse that. We were gonna do a deep dive with this and work in a jam board, but I know um, we don't have time for all of that. So I just wanted to make sure you got to see. And so here's just more information. And as you scroll, this is really about thinking of what you saw in the lesson and if it matched kind of your thinking. This is kind of what we called out from Open Syed's side of the, the things they set out to reduce barriers and what it might look like in that lesson. 
So that is all the links that I have for you today to look at those checkpoints and then to connect those checkpoints to the actual lesson for the Everest lesson that we just talked about. So we're not going to do five minutes of that. And again, I was going to have you go into breakout rooms, but we're not going to do that. And that's all right. I did build you a Jamboard though. So if you ever want to use this with colleagues, you're welcome to use the Jamboard, which is basically looking at examples and if they clarified or complicated your understandings of the three principles. So this Jamboard is there if you want to use it um, with your colleagues at some point in time. But we are at the end of our time. And again, I apologize for the internet trouble I had at the beginning. Um, and what I want to remind you is that all of these snapshots are available on YouTube under the Activate Learnings YouTube channel. Just subscribe, go to videos, or just find them right here, and they're all labeled snapshots. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming to learning about the UDL principles, and here is your link to the certificate of attendance. Once you click that link and fill it out, it will send you a PDF of your certificate of attendance. And thank you for your grace today with my internet troubles. I appreciate you. And thanks to those who have hung out with me over five of these. Some of you have been to all of them. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Remember, these are all on YouTube. And this is our final webinar in the Snapshot series. So thank you again. And thank you for your grace today. Rebecca, you have been a great help. Just these small webinars have really just pushed the thinking forward. Key oh. things like the initial model, like the notice and wondering. I don't know where everybody is out there, but just those small nuggets moves you closer, just a tiny bit closer to 3D teaching and learning. So really it's left up to us now to continue to dig deeper with some of the topics that you've presented. It is a heavy lift, guys. So you really do have to look at your five seminars and as a PL family, determine where we, we might dig deeper in some of those. Right now, we're working on academic productive talk. And we nice. saw that in the building upon ideas. So if any of you have never seen some of these clips extended, I encourage you to, to take a look at it.